I just wanted to mention, um, I didn't get to mention the first session, but one of the things that's been very encouraging for me, not just about this Savvy Sheep um, series, we've kind of done Savvy Sheep-esque kind of things for a while now, is just having conversations with people in our congregation and hearing how savvy they are. I was like, God, this is amazing. Like, our sheep are getting savvy. It's, it, it's been very encouraging for me just like, um, it's, it's like, oh, you've, you've actually been listening. Wow. And you remember, and you actually, like, you're able to recognize stuff. I mean, I shouldn't be shocked that people are listening to, to what we're teaching, but sometimes I do get surprised. Uh, so it's been very encouraging for me just to see, actually, many of you guys really wrestle with truth. You know your Bibles well. And if you're in university, that's especially encouraging for me because it means you've got a solid foundation. So that's, that's been very encouraging for me and one of the reasons why I, I love doing these kinds of equipping times because I think in the times that we're living in and the city that we're living in can be very helpful. I just want to start with a, with a scripture in Jude, um, it's, it's a, which I thought of just to start this session. Um, Jude, speaking in his letter, says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Isn't that beautiful? I feel the same heart. <laughs> I, I found it necessary <laughs> to appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered. It hasn't changed. The gospel hasn't changed. It's still the same. But every generation has its battles to fight, to contend for that faith, to contend for the true gospel. And so um, you can go to the next one. We, we, we're going to look at progressive Christianity now, but progressive Christianity, it's not a whole new topic. It's, it's, it's very much um, liberal theology with a postmodern twist, if I can put it that way. Postmodernism is the belief that the idea of absolute truth is naive. There's no such thing as absolute truth. We have to kind of wrestle and find our own truth. So your truth, my truth, you know, there's no meta-narratives. And they're actually very uh, condescending towards any view which smells like an absolute truth because we don't, we don't do that anymore, you know? Um, so li liberal theology with a postmodern twist is how I would describe progressive Christianity. But I, I'm going to go to uh, the closest thing that I could actually find to um, like a unifying this is what we believe for for. for Progressive Christianity. So this is actually from a, a progressive website. I've got eight points there. What do we mean when we call ourselves progressive Christians? And I, I'm going to work my way through this and then I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things which I feel like we as evangelical Christians need to contend for in our generation. Um, so number one, we believe that following the path and teachings of Jesus can lead to an awareness and experience of the sacred and the oneness and unity of all life. So that's that pantheistic idea that I was referencing before. So, so Jesus can lead us to an awareness um, of the sacred and oneness of life. We affirm that the teachings of Jesus provide one of many ways to experience the sacredness and oneness of life. That we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom. In a, this is progressive Christianity, by the way. I'm not sure why it's still called Christianity, but let's stick with it. Number three, uh, seek community that is inclusive of all people. And then they've got a long list of all the people that are included. Included, but not limited to. Sounds like the small print on your um, contract. Conventional Christians and questioning skeptics, believers and agnostics, women and men, those of all sexual orientations and gender identities, those of all classes and abilities. So that inclus inclusive ethos um, is very, very big. In fact, I actually found they are more united on the ethos of inclusivity than, than any doctrine about Jesus or the scripture. And those topics, they tended to be all over the place. But as soon as you get to issues of inclusivity, they're all lock stock, lock stock on the same, on the same, same way, wavelength. Number four, know that the way we behave towards one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. So action and love is more important than what 
we believe. I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that. I'll tell you why just now. Number five, find grace in the search for understanding and believe. Now listen to this. There is more value in questioning than in absolutes. So questioning is celebrated. Um, more celebrated than having absolute truth or knowledge on something. Number six, strive for peace and justice among all people. That's the justice, the social justice bent we were talking about earlier. Strive to protect and restore the integrity of our earth, environmentalism. We were joking about that in the students' digs the other day, but we inside jokes aside. Number eight, uh, commit to a path of lifelong learning, compassion, and selfless love. So I want to unpack why I think these are such big ethos uh, for the progressive Christianity. Um, Number one, pantheism. We spoke about this earlier, the difference between God being other, holy, separate, apart, above, over, in control, versus God being imminent, which means involved, close, sustaining, upholding. Um, that pantheistic worldview. In, so, so in our generation, we actually need to fight to contend for the holiness of God, the otherness of God, the fact that He's actually not like us. Yes, He is, but He's also not. Uh, there's a, a, a scripture which we probably all know uh, there. Um, uh, let the, forsake, the, the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and He will have mercy on them. Uh, to our God, if you will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I think it's important for us as a, as a generation to actually contend for the fact that actually God doesn't often or he doesn't always think like me. Because we tend to project the way we think onto God. You know, the God, God thinks like me. He's kind of like me. So, he, so if this makes sense to me, if this seems right to me, it's almost inevitable that's also how he thinks. But actually, he's, he's not like me. There's an otherness to God. He's, his thoughts are, are far higher than my thoughts. So our expectation when we read the scriptures shouldn't be that we would find wisdom that kind of is exactly what I thought all along because God thinks so similarly to me, right? We should actually expect to be constantly confronted with uncomfortable truths in the scripture. That should be our expectation. It will always be uncomfortable, but it should almost be like, yeah, yes, yet again, I confront something that's true, and I know it's true, but I so don't think like that. Lord, help me to recalibrate the way that I think, so that I would think like you would think. We need to contend for that in our generation. Next one is... Uh, to, to do with the, the inclusivity and exclusivity of Christ. This has to do with Jesus being the only way to the Father. I was chatting with, with Gary in the break. There seems to be some truths which people do believe, but you don't want to say it too loudly. Because <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. And especially if you're on campus. You know, this idea that Jesus is the only way to the Father. It's so hard to say it out loud these days. And I, I remember being in an alpha group and somebody said, are you suggesting that Jesus is the only way to the Father? And I remember all the Christians going, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, you did kind of suggest that at one point. And not to be in a disrespect to you or your faith, I'm sure it's precious and you're very sincere. You know, you almost feel like you immediately need to start. Um, but Jesus said it loud and proud, and, and, and it's one of the things we really have to stand for. He is inclusive in the sense that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. From the richest to the poorest to the most sinful to the most righteous, all who call. But it's only through Jesus. In that sense, it's exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you notice, I quote this almost every time I do an altar call in church on a Sunday. And I do that deliberately because many people, they struggle with that. And, but it's only through Jesus, actually. Um, and and when, some, one of the ways I explain this to people is that if you had one child and you sacrificed your only child for the salvation of somebody else, would you do it to provide one more way to be saved. That's just dumb. I mean, if there was another way, are you kidding me? Like, that, that would be insanity, you know? Um, but we need to fight for that. 
the next one. Um, to do with gender, um, this is a quotation from Richard Raw, who's a very famous, very outspoken progressive Christian. There's something underlying this inclusivity that we need to talk about. It's a fruit of something else. And here, I believe, is what, what, the, what the something under, underneath is, actually. It's got to do with the understanding of human nature. We all need to know that this wonderful thing called life is going somewhere and it's somewhere good. It is going someplace good because it came from goodness. A beginning of original blessing instead of original sin. For some reason, most Christian theology seems to start with Genesis 3, which features Adam and Eve, what Augustine would centuries later call original sin. When you start with the negative or with a problem, it's not surprising that you end with Armageddon an apocalypse. When you start with a punitive, critical, exclusionary God, it's not surprising that you see the crucifixion as substitutionary atonement, where Jesus takes the punishment that this angry God intended for us. You can see where he's going. He's actually got a different view of human nature. He doesn't believe that humans are intrinsically sinful. We're actually intrinsically good because we come from good and God made us good in the garden. And so when God sees you and me whether you're a Christian or not, he sees something beautiful and good. And there's no need for Jesus to die on the cross to die for your sins because he doesn't see you as sinful. Do, 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 you, understand, do you understand where the starting point is actually quite different? So he blames it on, on Augustine, this idea of original sin. There's another quote that I'd like to read. Um, this is such a crucial question. Why did Jesus come? That's a fantastic question. Why did he come, Richard? Uh, Jesus did not come to change the mind of God about humanity. It didn't need changing. God has organically, inherently loved what God created from the moment God created it. Jesus came to change the mind of humanity about God. Essentially, he came to change our mind that God is angry with us. He's not angry with us. He came to change our mind about that, um, that we feel disqualified to come into his presence. Jesus came to convince us otherwise. So there's this lie that says that God loves me and accepts me the way that I am. Now that's half true. And therefore, it's inclusive. Christianity is inclusive, you know, because he doesn't see you as sinful. There's no definition of really sin. God doesn't think of people like that. Um, so he loves you just the way you are. He accepts you just the way you are. Whatever you think about yourself, whatever lifestyle you have, he's inclusive in that sense because humans are not intrinsically sinful. The truth is that um, we have redemption, the Bible says in Ephesians, through his blood. That's a substitutionary atonement, by the way. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. But it also says, thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So this idea of original sin didn't start with Augustine. It started right there in Romans. And that it's, it's actually throughout the scriptures that actually we're sinful and we need a savior. We need somebody to pay the, for our sins. And we need the Holy Spirit to come and transform us and make us good. We actually aren't acceptable the way we are. It's only in Christ that we become acceptable through his atonement. Does that make sense? It's a crucial, crucial difference in a starting point. Uh, but what's interesting, did you notice there how everything unraveled? when he changed his starting point of how it all begins with sin. Suddenly the cross and substitutionary atonement, it all just started to not make sense anymore. It's like one of those threads when you pull on it, everything just unravels afterwards. So, so why would Jesus die on the cross then if we're not sinful? It, it, it all starts to, to fall apart. So they have a, an emphasis on love, and I've put that in, in a quotation, rather than on doctrine. Um, and this is a very distinctive of progressive Christianity. They'd, 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 they'd actually sniff at any talk of doctrine or um, absolute biblical truth. And here's why. This is a very outspoken progressive Christi uh, Christian, uh, Jen Hatmaker. She said, I lack all objectivity. It's quite a confession. I evaluate the, mer the merit of every idea based on uh, how it bears upon actual people. When loving God results in pain, 
exclusion, harm, or trauma to people, then we are absolutely doing the first part wrong. It's not God and error, but us. So she evaluates an idea, whether it's true or false, based on how it makes other people feel. That's quite, that's quite a confession, but it is helpful to know that because it can creep into our thinking as well. When we read what the Bible says about something, and it sounds a bit harsh, and, and that's going to hurt people's feelings, or we start thinking about the implications that that would have for people, so therefore we struggle to believe that it's true. It's not just progressive Christians that can creep into our thinking as well, that actually guides the way, can guide the way we actually understand truth. So there's an emphasis on love rather than, than doctrine. But in Ephesians it says we speak the truth in love. It's not truth or love. We speak the truth in love. Um, and speaks about not being blown uh, to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Um, but, but rather we speak the truth in love. In, uh, so, so the takeaway line here is we, we don't evaluate ideas based upon how they make people feel. We base it, we evaluate truth according to what, what Scripture says. So the other thing to mention about the progressive Christianity is actually, it actually celebrates doubt. And I think this has got to do with postmodernism. Postmodernism doubt is celebrated because if you feel too certain and strongly and it's too absolute, then they think of you as being naive. So, so doubt and, and questioning is good. It's almost like a sign of maturity. There's something of that that's translated across into um, progressive Christianity. She, uh, she said more, more value in questioning than in absolute truth. But what's interesting about this idea is that the first spectacular sin came from a question, did God really say? And so we're going to talk a little bit about doubt, but doubt can be incredibly destructive and lead to spectacular moral sin, um, because it, it, anything that's not done in faith produces sin. So the word deconstructing, I want to talk about that a little bit now. What people generally mean by it when they say they're deconstructing their faith is if they're framing it in a, in a positive sense, what they mean is that they are re-evaluating what they've always believed to find out if maybe culture has actually shaped their thinking and added to truth. So they're trying to declutter and get it down to its its most purest form. That's what they tend to mean by deconstructing. But um, the Bible has a lot to say to, to people doubting. And this is something important for us to know because we, we, we will encounter people, or maybe ourselves be, people struggling with doubt at some point. It is actually quite normal to experience doubt. If you haven't, you haven't experienced doubt, it's, you just maybe haven't served Jesus for, for very long. It's part of life. What's important is, is, is how you process your doubt. Not whether or not you doubt. It's how you process it. So the Bible actually says, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So there it's the implications of that doubt can produce sin. So we hate sin, but we're merciful and empathetic to people when they are experiencing doubt. So the whole idea of deconstructing your faith, it's an interesting word because there already was a word which has fallen out of favor. It used to be called reforming Christianity. So the Reformation, you heard of that? The, the, the Reformation was actually doing exactly that, decluttering Christianity from the cultural additions that had happened over time, bringing it back to the gospel, the truth of the scripture. It's called, it was called a Reformation. So it's interesting that the word choice is now shifted to deconstructing faith, and it often looks different too. But deconstructing my faith actually doesn't often refer to scripture. It's actually evaluating what I believe in the light of modern cultural wisdom. The best of modern thinking, to borrow that phrase from earlier. Do you understand the difference? And that is incredibly destructive because you're not using the right measurement for deconstructing your faith. The other thing we can say about celebrating doubt, there is a very strong culture of your truth versus my truth, which then goes into um, uh, the black perspective, the white perspective, the western perspective, the 
male perspective, the female perspective, and it becomes all about interpretations of Scripture, but then it is a slippery slope into subjectivity and to the point where you begin to wonder, can we actually know what's true? You know, if it's always just about this person's perspective and my culture is what's defining what I believe. So this tweet here, this person actually, all he said was, um, there's only one correct meaning of any biblical text. Classic evangelical belief, you know. Yes, people might have different perspectives, but there's only one correct meaning <laughs> for any biblical truth. So this person points to this comment and says, that's a classic example of white supremacy. Like that escalated quite quickly because that's a classic evangelical uh, belief that, that yes, we all need to find God's perspective. We need to realign our thinking and our, our understanding to the, to the truth of God's scripture. So, with regards to social justice and environmental activism, I've already mentioned this. When you don't believe in an afterlife, a, a future heaven and a future earth and a future hope and a day when Jesus will come and return and make all things right, your focus does naturally tend towards trying to make life better here and now, trying to make earth heavenly. It does naturally tend towards that. So we, we've already touched on that and I've also done a whole savvy sheep on that one. So we won't go too much in detail with that. So one of the things um, that I, and we can't, we're kind of coming into, into land uh, now, one of the crucial things I feel that we as Christians need to wrestle with, where all the liberal Christians tended to go wrong, was actually how we engage with culture. And the question is, we actually do need to engage with the culture around us. Why? Because we need to know how people think so that we can engage with them in a meaningful way, right? We don't, need to, we don't want to necessarily think like them, but you, you want to understand how they think. We want to understand the kinds of questions people are asking. Otherwise, when you talk, it's like you're talking on two different languages. You want to answer the kind of questions that they're asking, right? You want to connect with them like that. But when people take it too far is when they try and explain the gospel to such an extent to make it understandable and relatable that they actually end up watering down the gospel. And that's a slippery slope that happens so quickly. See, the problem with explaining the gospel is you can only explain it so far. There's always going to be an aspect to the gospel which is going to be offensive, no matter how much you explain it, unless you actually change the gospel. I'll give you an example. If you're speaking to an unbeliever, it's true that you're a sinner, and I am. And in fact, you're so sinful that you can't save yourself. You need Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. Now, we love that, but that's actually quite an offensive thing to say, isn't it? And there's no way you can explain that away. That, that is the gospel. That's as simple as it gets. And so when, when Paul speaks in, the, in his letters, he often speaks about being a fool for Christ and people thinking he's an idiot, basically, because their wisdom doesn't match up with his wisdom. And he speaks about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. There is an untranslatable aspect to God's wisdom. That actually, you can't actually fully explain. And so we have to, and this is crucial for us, we actually have to make peace with the fact that as much as we're going to try and explain what we believe to unbelievers and skeptics for their sakes, we have to be prepared to look foolish. And, that, that's, and if we're not prepared to look foolish, you'll fall into the trap of liberal theology because you'll end up explaining away the most embarrassing parts of what we believe like hell. For example, I don't know if you've heard the expression, you know, like the canary that they carry down the mine shaft, and the canary is there so that if any toxic gases um, are around, the canary dies first, and then the miners can take, can take heed, like, oh, wow, we need to get out of here quick because the, the canary just bought it, so now, you know, he, he's more sensitive to these things. Theologically, the canary is the doctrine of hell. In the church culture, when that doctrine dies, the canary just died. You need to get out fast. It's, 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 it's one of the most difficult doctrines to try and explain in a way that's very palatable to unbelievers. It's so hard to do it. I've never yet succeeded. It always feels a bit offensive. Um, so, so, so we need to get that balance right between uh, engaging with culture, 
We, we don't lock ourselves away from culture. We do want to engage with culture, but we never want to water down the gospel. We have to say it like it is, whether or not it's coming across well or understandable or, or is offensive or, or not. The other thing we need to, to wrestle with is this false dichotomy or this false dilemma to, to have to choose between faith or science. Remember in, when we did the first session in liberal theology, they, they tried to separate faith and science. And it, Christians often feel like they need to choose between do I believe God or do I believe science. To, to just mention a word on this, science is actually the study of God's creation. Right? That's what it is. God created nature. It's not like nature is something so fundamentally different to God. He created it. Science is the study of... So science and, and, and creation are not uh, opposed to each other. The problem is that science agrees with the Bible, but scientists don't. Because you can't have science without scientists, and scientists are human. And, so, and, and humans have agendas, and they have things that they like and they don't like. They have biases, and, and, and they... And increasingly, science is becoming very politicized nowadays. I don't know if it's always been that way, but it just feels incredibly politicized right now. Um, and it even censored at, at certain points, if, if they come to certain conclusions that are not uh, politically correct to say. So, so Christians don't have to choose between faith and science, but we do have to be comfortable with the fact that oftentimes faith hasn't, I mean, science hasn't quite caught up with the Bible yet. Sometimes you just have to wait a couple of decades and then it does catch up because science is also a developing field. And so it's not omniscient and it makes mistakes and it learns as it goes along. That's the nature of science. We know things now scientifically that we didn't know 100 years ago. And so sometimes it takes a little while to catch up. So, so, so here's, here's the battleground. The, these are the, the doctrines I feel like in our generation, these are the ones that are under fire. And now I'm talking about in progressive Christianity, but it's leaking into the evangelical church. I shouldn't say even leaking in. Evangelical church is, is, is wholesale given in and watered down. Many of these core, to use an old expression, fundamentals of the faith. Um, a hesitancy or a denial of sin, judgment, and then hell. I mentioned that's the canary in the mine shaft. Um, by, the, by the way, the, the name that I didn't want to mention earlier, the one about hell being a caricature, that was Tim Keller. Yeah, I'll, so all I'm saying is it, it's, it's easy to, to, to want to soften doctor. It's, it's a real, I face it when I'm preaching, sometimes you want to preach something but it's like, it's hard to say that. It's, it, it, it's, it's a thing, you know, it's hard. The pressure is real. Um, <laughs> substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Uh, you may have heard of, you know, this idea of Jesus dying on the cross that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's like cosmic child abuse. You heard that phrase? That's, if you haven't, you've heard it now. Um, the inspiration or authority of scripture. That's an old one, but it's still a thing. Massive thing. Um, the literal versus metaphorical reading of scripture. Things like hell is now often being interpreted metaphorically. Or even Genesis interpreted metaphorically and the resurrection interpreted metaphorically. So there are portions of scripture which are metaphorical and we'll interpret it that way, but when things are interpreted metaphorically because they make us feel uncomfortable, then there's a, a wrestle now in terms of integrity. Does that make sense? So I'll close by saying that um, in our generation, if you want to talk about, Paul mentioned, even if an angel should come and preach another gospel other than the one you've heard, it's our fight to hold on to the true gospel, the one that's been handed down to us. And these, these are some of the issues which, you, if you haven't faced already, we need, to, we will have to face, and we'll have to. It will require courage from us and the Holy Spirit wisdom from us to, to wrestle and to discern and to hold on to. Um, what Christ is, has taught us in the scripture. And, and I think we as a church need to encourage one another in these things. It's, it's as we face these things together because when Jesus comes back, 
He's coming back for a pure bride. And a pure bride is a bride that has kept herself holy and set apart in terms of sin. But it also got to do with pure in holding on to the truth of what Jesus has taught us in the face of intimidation and uh, temptation to, 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 to sell out on what we believe because it's not popular anymore or it's not acceptable anymore. Does that make sense? Can I pray for us? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, and thank you for your Holy Spirit, and thank you for church. God, thank you that we can have these times, that we can look at your word. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that when you return, that you would find us to be a people that are steadfast, that are courageous, and that we are pure. Lord, that we would read your word as the highest authority in our life, that we would allow it to search us, that you would, we would allow it to change us, to shift us, that when we come to your word, we wouldn't come with a presumptuous attitude that you think like us, God, because your ways are higher than ours. Your thoughts are higher than ours, Lord, and we, we want to be a humble people. God, I pray that you would protect us and that you would make us such a witness and a light, God, in this world that you've put us in, that we would keep the gospel pure so that people can be saved, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.